Turn to Proverbs 1.23. Proverbs 1 and verse 23. This verse is uh, right after Proverbs 1.22, in case you didn't know that. And Proverbs 1.22 says, How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity, and the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge? Turn you, verse 23, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. So these words are written to people that have been scorners and fools uh, and uh, simple ones for a long time, for too long, like we talked about last time. And what wisdom is telling them is to turn. So in other words, change course, turn around, or bad things are going to happen. And that's what, what we are going to talk about in the rest of this chapter later on. <clears throat> and we saw there in the previous verse and in what is coming uh, that these people here are headed for destruction. And if you think about it, uh, like, for instance, if you were in a car and it was driving towards a cliff or even better, probably a wall or something like that, and you've been driving towards that wall for a long time and getting closer and closer to it, really the only way you're going to not hit it is to turn, right? You've got to turn to the right hand or to the left. And that's what the Lord is telling us here. To turn is to change or reverse course, to alter the course of, to cause to go another way, to divert or deflect. So the thing about sin is, is that it compounds. And the longer that we let it go, the more it compounds. And then the more other sin it introduces, and it builds upon itself. It's kind of like compound interest. If you think about it, compound interest can be a good thing if you're a saver, but it can be a devastating thing if you're a debtor, right? It, either way, it's, it's going to rack up your balance, whether it's in your bank account or, or your, your debt, one of the two. And sin is the same way, and so is righteousness. Righteousness will feed on itself, too, and you make right decisions, and then that takes you down right paths, and you end up making more right decisions. And sin's the same way. Um, left unchecked, it's just going to keep compounding. And I'll give you some verses for that. Look at Romans 6 and verse 19. <clears throat> and just a real practical application of this. Everybody knows that if you tell a lie then chances are you're going to have to tell another lie to cover for that lie because the lie is not the truth and it's not consistent with truth. And then somebody's going to say, well, wait a minute, that you were where? You said you were where? And then all of a sudden now you've got to make up another lie to cover for that lie. And it's just one thing adding up to another. Or like with David when he committed adultery. And then, of course, I'm sure he lied about that. And then he tried to cover it up by bringing uh, Uriah back. And then when that didn't work, then he killed him. And so just one sin uh, feeds into another. Romans 6 and verse 19 says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded yourselves servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. So this verse shows us that it works both ways. Iniquity unto iniquity, one sin to another, or righteousness unto holiness. So it, it happens both ways, and we're looking at the sin at this point. Now let me give you a couple more verses. Look at Jeremiah six and I'm sorry, nine and verse three. <clears throat> and there's a there's a, a point that I'm gonna make here, so I'm this is why I'm I'm, bu I'm building up to it. Uh, Jeremiah nine <clears throat> and verse three. It says, and they bend their tongues like their bow for lies, but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Iniquity unto iniquity, evil to evil. And let me give you one more. Isaiah 30 and verse 1. <clears throat> Isaiah 30 and verse 1. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. Like the woman that sleeps around, right? That's sin. And then she gets pregnant, and then what does she do? She has an abortion, right? She kills the baby, right? So it's just one iniquity, one sin, unto another sin. And I just 
this verse jumped out at me today when it says there that the rebellious children, they take counsel, but not of me and that cover with a covering, but not my spirit. And that just reminds me of people going to modern psychologists, ungodly psychologists, where they're getting counsel, but not from the Lord. They're not getting counsel from God's word or from a godly person, but they're getting the worldly counsel of the psychologist or the psychiatrist. And they cover with a covering. They're going to cover up their problem, basically. They're not going to deal with it. They're not, they're not going to deal with it with God's spirit. They're going to deal with it with worldly methods. So here's the point. The longer that we wait, the sharper the turn has to be to avert the disaster. The longer you're heading towards the, the wall, if you get within 10 feet of that thing, you're going to have to really swerve, and you're probably going to do some damage to your car. And you might not hit it head on, but you're still going to smash it up, right? And this is what, what wisdom is saying here, how long, right? Wisdom asked there in the previous verse, and she says to turn before it's too late. So turning is a synonym for repentance and conversion. And we read about a lot about repentance and conversion in the New Testament. Convert means to turn or change in character, nature, form, or function. To turn in mind, feeling, or conduct. To bring into another state of mind, etc. And to repent means to affect oneself with contrition or regret for something done, etc. It's to feel contrition, compunction, sorrow, or regret for something one has done or left undone. To change one's mind with regard to past action or conduct through dissatisfaction with it or its results. So to repent and to be converted are similar terms and they both mean to turn. To turn in the direction that you're headed and to turn your mind. It all starts in the mind, right? It's every sin, every, everything that we do starts in the mind, including sin. Um, and repentance likewise starts in the mind. <clears throat> so wisdom's call here to turn is just like the New Testament call to repent and turn to God and do meet works, meet for repentance, like Paul said in Acts 26 and verse 20. Acts 26 and verse 20. So basically what you're reading here in Proverbs chapter 1 is a gospel message. It is telling sinners to turn from their wicked ways. Acts 26 and verse 20. And this was uh, what the Apostle Paul was to do after he was commissioned by Jesus Christ to go to the Gentiles. It says, but showed, me for, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. I was going to mention, there's this preacher out in Arizona, Stephen Anderson. I don't want to, I don't want to really get into that, but he is an Arminian and he sees these verses in the Bible about repentance and he recognizes that repentance is a work and he knows that salvation is not of works, it's just of your faith, right, is what he thinks. So therefore, if, if, if salvation is only by your faith and it's not by works and repentance is a work, therefore repentance is not necessary for salvation. And so then what he ends up doing then is saying that the Bible, that he takes it another step and he says that the Bible does not teach that you have to repent of your sins. It only teaches that you have to repent of your unbelief. It's like, talk about iniquity unto iniquity. It's like false doctrine unto false doctrine. Your Arminianism gets you all screwed up in the first place, and then you end up saying that you don't even need to repent of sin. And The Bible doesn't even tell you to repent of sin. It tells you to repent of unbelief. That's the only sin it tells you to repent of. It's just, it's, it's really something how people can end up going down a, a doctrinal rabbit hole like that and end up in a than a vipers. So anyway, <clears throat> so this is why uh, scripture exhorts us to exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And that's what it says in Hebrews uh, 3.13. We don't have to turn there. But <clears throat> notice what, what scripture tells us to do in regards to our sin. It's to turn today, right? While it is called today. <clears throat> the Lord tells us uh, numerous times that now is the time. Look at Hebrews 3, 7 through 8. So this goes for somebody who's a complete heathen, who's never even heard the gospel, and when he hears it the first time, now's the time. But you know what? It goes for every one of us, because all of us sin. Uh, John says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we all sin, 
And the time to turn from that sin is now. It's not to let it go and, and say, I'll deal with that later. It's, it's now. Hebrews 3, 7 through 8. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. <clears throat> and then uh, Hebrews, 7, uh, Hebrews 4, 7. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is written, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. This is what happens to a lot of people, I think, is that they hear the gospel and they believe it, but then, oh, my wife's not converted yet, or my parents aren't going to like this, or whatever, and we end up putting it off, putting it off, putting it off, instead of doing it today. And then what happens is you never end up doing it. And I know people like this. I've got close friends of mine that uh, way back in 2006, when I got back from overseas and we started some Bible studies, and within a very short time, within a few months, they went from being like NIV, NLT, message, garbage, perversion, Bible reading people, believing in Arminianism and dispensationalism and premillennialism and you name it, all the isms, and pretty much believe in the truth believe in having the true Bible, true sovereign grace, true eschatology, everything. And, but they never took the step. Never did it. <clears throat> I'm not sure. Well, I know why. I know one reason why, but I'm not going to tell you. But anyway, but they never did it. And guess what? They're still going to some Presbyterian church. Yep. They're, oh, it's a sovereign grace Presbyterian church, but they've never been baptized. They won't become members because they know that uh, it's not a real church, and the baptism's not valid, so they've never had communion for like, you know, how, how many ever years? It's been now 13 years or something, and just won't won't join a real church, you know, for whatever reason. But <clears throat> so, and then when you don't do that, eventually God just takes away the understanding that He gave you and gives it to somebody else. Look at Second Corinthians, yeah, Second Corinthians six two. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 6 and verse 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. <clears throat> Speaking of temporal salvation, of course, you know, God, God decides when you're saved eternally. You don't make that decision today. But temporally speaking, today is the day of salvation. And the reason is because God gives us a space of repentance. And we don't know how long that space is. You remember in uh, Revelation 2 with Jezebel, that the woman uh, that called herself a prophetess. And she had um, quite an interesting uh, <clears throat> church situation here. And God, believe it or not, gave her space to repent. You, you'd think, given what I'm going to read you here, that God would have just said, oh, bolt of lightning, you're dead. But he actually gave this woman space to repent, which is quite amazing. The Lord is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Revelation 2.20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. You think about that. She's got like a sex club going on in the church, basically. And the Lord gave her space to repent of that, of all things. <clears throat> but here's what happens when you don't repent in your space. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds, and I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth, searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. So, if you don't repent in your space, then judgment comes. And just like it was said in Genesis fifteen sixteen that the, it says that the cup of the Amorites is not yet full, right? That every, every nation, every people, every individual has a cup for their iniquity. And we don't know how deep it is. We don't know how full it is. But God's, he'll only suffer it to get so full. And when that cup is full, then God judges. And that's why we turn, right? That's going back to the proverb. Turn you. 
turn before it's too late. And like I said about the car heading to the heading towards the wall, you got to turn quickly. And this is what the Bible teaches: make haste, delay not to keep God's commandments. I'm sure you've heard it said that delayed obedience is disobedience. That goes with children, and it goes with uh, us adults as well. Psalm one nineteen and verse sixty. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. <clears throat> now there's certain things we're not supposed to be hasty in. You know, certain decisions we should take our time, right? The Bible teaches us not to be hasty in, in certain things. But when it comes to keeping God's commandments, you don't need to deliberate on it too long. You don't need to think about it and weigh the pros and the cons or whatever. None of that. Just do it, right? There's, there's no... Uh, no consideration necessary. Then the next part of uh, Proverbs 1 and verse 23 tells us that I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. So this is the result of turning at my reproof. Turn, turn you at my reproof, at my reproof, and then God will pour out his spirit unto us. So the message doesn't stop at repentance. There's a promise attached to the message. If you turn... God will give you of his spirit. Now, and I've talked about the the giving of the spirit and the temporal and the eternal, and this is not talking about regeneration where the spirit of God indwells your heart and and that kind of thing. this This is a temporal giving of the spirit. And I'll show you what specifically it is because the verse actually tells us what it is. This is how we can know if a man's filled with God's spirit, when God's words are made known unto him. Because that's what it says there. I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make known my words unto you. That's how a person can know if they're filled with the spirit. You go to a lot of these so-called churches, these charismatic Pentecostal churches, and they're filled with the spirit. And how do you know they're filled with the spirit? Right, (laughs) exactly. They're jumping around. They're barking like dogs. They're gobbling like turkeys. That's being filled with the spirit. They have holy laughter, right? Like uh, Kenneth Copeland and all this crazy stuff. And that's filled with the spirit. They, they're, they're filled with the spirit, right. right. The, doc, the spirit of devils. But that's not what the Bible teaches being filled with the spirit is. Being filled with the spirit is understanding God's word. And being filled with the spirit is not a feeling. Like I think a lot of people think, oh, I, I mean, you've probably heard people say this, I could just feel the spirit in there. Right? Church was so wonderful, I could feel the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, Jacob said in, in Genesis twenty-eight sixteen that the Lord, surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. The Lord was right there in Jacob's presence, and he didn't even know it. Genesis 28, 16. So it's not a feeling. You're not going to, you know, your, your emotions do not equate to the Holy Spirit. And that's what most people, I really think, they, they wouldn't admit this, and they might not even understand it, but what most people really equate to the Holy Spirit is their emotions. They go to church, they hear a sermon that touches them, or they the song was so beautiful, or the choir was so great, or whatever, and they feel so good, and that's the spirit. No. But the pastors in those churches actually teach that to the congregation. Right, yeah, so it's no wonder they believe they, it. They, they brainwash the members. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you used to be in it. Yeah, it's hard. No, it's true. The kingdom of God is righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. So there is joy in the Holy Ghost, but that's not how you can know if you have the Spirit, right? It's not if you feel it. It's if, do you understand God's words? Do you understand his doctrine? That's how you can know that you've been given the Spirit. And I'll give you a a verse, two verses, a comparison, which will show you this. And this is so neat. I remember the first time... It was actually uh, a woman in another church pointed this out to me, and she'd heard it in sermons, and I just, I don't know if I hadn't been around long enough at that point to hear it, or if I'd heard it and then forgotten it. Anyway, turn to Ephesians 5. I don't know if I told you what verse to go to, but uh, she pointed this out, and I just thought, wow, that, that was like the greatest thing since sliced bread to me. And she's like, oh, I'm surprised you didn't know that. Like, the pastor's taught that before, but I think I was new, so maybe I hadn't heard it yet. But anyway, um, Ephesians 5, 18 through 19 <clears throat> it says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, 
speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, I want you to keep your finger there, and let's turn over to Colossians. The book of Colossians is very similar to the book of Ephesians, um, written by the same man, the Apostle Paul, to these churches. And you'll see a lot of the same, the, the instruction he gives to husbands and wives is very similar. The instruction he gives about children obeying their parents is very similar. Uh, a lot of things in it are, are very similar. And this is basically a parallel text in Colossians 3 and verse 16. So let's read that and then compare it with Ephesians. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, notice in Colossians 3.16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And then it goes on to say about teaching and admonishing with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, right? And then in Ephesians 5.18 and 19, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Okay, so we see here, if you compare those two verses, Verse 18 of Ephesians 5 says, Be filled with the Spirit. Verse, the first part of verse 16 in Colossians 3 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. You see? Those are the same thing. Being filled with the Spirit is letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom. You see? So if the word of Christ dwells in you, you are full of the Spirit. Even if you're not jumping up and down with great joy or whatever and having some exuberant experience, right? You are filled with the Spirit. And chances are, if you're jumping up and down with exuberance, you're probably not really filled with the Spirit. You're filled with some substitute thing out there, um, which is not the Spirit of God. I mean, was Jesus Christ filled with the Spirit? Yeah, it says that he giveth him not the Spirit by measure unto him, right? Was Jesus Christ jumping up and down and just happy, happy, joy, joy every day of his life? No. You know what he was called? A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And yet, he had more of the Holy Spirit than any of us will ever even dream of having. So when a wayward sinner hearkens to wisdom's cry and turns at her reproof, he will begin to be filled with God's Spirit and to understand the Word of God. That's why it's so important to turn from sin, because if you don't turn from sin, we quench the Spirit, we don't get the Spirit, we don't understand, and we have our understanding taken away. And I've seen this happen, and so have you. I've seen this happen to people where they have turned away from the truth, from the, do- from the truth of the doctrine of the Bible, and then having that understanding taken away and not understanding things that they used to. I've seen it happen. 